guys, I'm Lena. Welcome to my all analog photography channel. Last month I was doing a double exposure project for an art show and posted the process on Instagram. And I got so many messages asking for a full double exposure video that here I am doing it. I've played with double exposures in the first year of my master's and here are some prints. They were super tricky to do and what I printed this year for the show was way easier, but actually also better executed. So in this video we are going to do a double exposure print together and along the way I will talk about the basic principles. At the end I will explain how I did my previous double exposure prints. So let's start with the setup and materials. Two enlargers would be of course perfect, but not everybody has such a luxurious setup. Don't be discouraged because double exposing with one enlarger is entirely possible and just to prove this point this is what we are going to do. The paper I recommend for such experiments is Ilford Multigrade Classic Fiber or RC Generation 5. Generation 5 not 4. When two negatives overlap they inevitably bring down the overall contrast and papers like Foma are naturally just a bit too soft for the specific technique uh, to my taste. Otherwise, they're great, but not for us right now. Ilford simply offers the best contrast control and you will really need it. If you have no idea about variable contrast and how it works, I'm explaining everything in my old but very good split filter printing video. Next thing you need are two negatives. The negatives or the scene should be of medium or rather elevated contrast or at least one negative should be high contrast because otherwise all those overlapping middle grays they will just create this muddy effect on the image. I found two pictures I took over 10 years ago and I thought of combining this fallen electric tower on Mount Elbrus and those hills walking over it. But those are some of my very very first rolls and I could never imagine them meeting in such a way. Once negatives are selected, it's Photoshop time. Yes, I admit, I'm using a digital tool. I put aside all the all analog ideology once I realized how much time is wasted on figuring out the perfect composition and alignment in the darkroom. It's enough to photograph and invert the negative with your phone. You don't need some super quality reproduction. So we open Photoshop on the laptop or Snapseed on the phone or anything that allows you to make digital double exposures. In Photoshop, you should select linear burn as overlay mode. This is exactly how it's going to look on your print. On the device you can zoom in and out, rotate, crop, change contrast and immediately see potential problems. For example, in our case I have the negative edges going across the print and we will have to work around them. I also immediately see which parts should be dodged or burned. A video which is useful to watch before jumping at double exposures is the dodging and burning tutorial. In 7 minutes I list every single tool and technique you will ever need to do darker magic. So now we're finally getting to the analog part. If you have two enlargers you can skip many things from this tutorial including finding an empty light tight box. With one enlarger that's a must. For all the dodging burning stuff I also have some cardboard ready. If you're lucky both negatives overlap in a straightforward way and look good, but most likely one will be straight and the other rotated or zoomed in or zoomed out, so we start with the one which is easier to set up. My electric tower shot is straight, so it goes in first. Then you should take a piece of paper identical in size to the paper you will print on. For example, the back of a failed print is perfect. Position it in the easel exactly like when printing and make the outline of the projected image. Once it's done, we're moving to making test strips. So here I have for a 12 seconds at f11 filter 3, which is good because the negative is contrasty by itself. We need to stay on the lighter side, but we aren't sure how the images will affect each other. So we are doing another test trip. We are doing fewer options. I closed the aperture one stop to f16 and did 7 seconds overall and plus 2 seconds on the half. So it's either 7 or 9 seconds at f16, which corresponds to 3.5 or 4.5 seconds at f11. It's best to expose two test strips like this in case the first one doesn't work out. 
with the upper side marked on the back, the tests are stored in the light tight box and now we're changing negatives. Now we have our outline, we have the example on the phone, which saves a lot of time when finding the perfect composition. Once everything is aligned, we do the next test now of the current negative. I chose filter 5 because the negative is rather flat and I want the shoes to really pop without all those stupid grays making a mess in the middle. When the potential exposure time is found, it's time to pull out our undeveloped tests of the first image. Making sure the paper is in the same direction important, we are making tests on top, not vertically, but horizontally or diagonally. We take a medium to light time, but where blacks are already dark enough and do plus and minus 20-ish percent of the middle time. For example, your good time is 10 seconds and you do 8 seconds and 12 seconds. So you do 8 seconds exposure and then plus 2, plus 2. You want each exposure strip to go through the maximum amount of different tones. So this is why we are doing them diagonally. In the end, this is the print that I got and here it's super easy to find the perfect exposure and I'm also happy with the chosen contrast filters. If you're lucky, that's it. But sometimes you will, like me, have the edge of the negative going through the frame and you might want some overall corrections. For example, I don't like this cloud here going through the shoe. It makes the, the boot look really dirty, so I need to remove it. And I also think that the boots themselves could be slightly darker. When you work around the edge of the negative, the trick is to soften the sharp line and then compensate the exposure with the other negative. So let me explain. When separated, the prints look like this, but when combined, they blend perfectly. Of course, this doesn't work with all subjects, but if there are a lot of small details, they kind of conceal all our tricks perfectly. For my analog Photoshop, I'm marking where exactly the lines are passing. Before the exposure, I position the cardboards and already start moving them, getting used to this movement and only then set off the exposure. In my case, the edge is too close to the shoe, so I can't really move the cardboard much. If you have more space, it's much better to lift the cardboard so the shadow is slightly softer and move it a little bit in wider movements. This way it will really blend nicely. But here we have what we have uh, dodging here. Our brain is already getting used to this movement, then we hit start and then the other hand can be used for any other tricks on the on the print. Now, to make the boots darker, I am burning them through a hole. With the top side marked, the print goes in the dark bag and in the box. I very, very, very strongly advise to print at least five copies, because for sure, I guarantee something will go wrong and you will want to change something or you will accidentally put the paper under the enlarger upside down. If you get it perfect from the first copy, congratulations. Now you can print four more for your friends, grandmother or to sell online. After all the copies are exposed, we're changing the negative again to the first one, which is easier to align and we align it to the outline we made in the beginning. In my negative, I am dodging removing the clouds and making it a little lighter under the rock. And then I'm adding exposure to the parts which were left blank in the first negative. Here I have more space to move, so I'm raising the cardboard for a softer edge and moving it more freely. The additional time is normally about 60-70% of the main exposure, so here I have um, I think 7.5 seconds and or 7 and I added 5 in each corner. But if the time is for whichever reason off, guess what? You have 4 more attempts to fix that. And this is how we get a double exposure. Let's go over the steps once again. Of course, you can just make a test of each negative and then print the selected times one over another. I'm showing a more complicated method, but which allows much more control over the results. With the first test, we determine a good time for the first negative. Then we prepare a test for double exposure. We expose two possible times, which could look good, because you never for sure know how the two negatives will work together. This exposure goes in the light tight box. You do not develop it yet. We move to the second negative, make and develop a test. Once the time is selected, 
we expose this time plus and minus about 20% on the paper with the exposure of the first negative, which we take out of the light tight box. The result will be several combinations of times, and it will be very easy to select a good one. Now you can make several copies of the final exposure time of the first negative, store them in the box, change negative, and expose the second image on top. Now I'm going to go through my old double exposures. The very first ones I did in the first year of my master's because I correctly thought it would be a great exercise for learning dodging and burning. And yes, I did learn a lot, but it was a little bit ambitious project for someone who printed in the dark room for maybe a month before in total. All the prints were done from two 4x5 negatives in two enlargers. I first printed from one enlarger and then I kind of went over to someone else's enlarger and used that one as well. The main trick to those two prints was to use the grays from one image and the darkest lines as outlines from another. So let me show you. I printed the angel with a lower filter, so all the sky that you see is from the angel. If you try combining a sky from this image and a sky from this image, you will have like a dirty cloud in between and it's not something you want to do. So I kept only one sky and this photograph, I overexposed it heavily to blow the skies. I overdeveloped it. So all I have is the outlines. Well, there are some grays, you know, I didn't really overdo it, but at least I made sure that all the highest zones, all the highlights, are really almost transparent, almost. And then I printed it with filter 5. So everything that you see in here, which seems like light gray, is actually this sky going through. It's absolutely transparent. If you print this image separately, it's uh, transparent, it's blank. So this is how I got rid of the sky and then filled out all the whites in here and uh, have no overlap lines. And the same thing was done with... Um, this photograph, this girl's skin is actually the sky behind her because I heavily overexposed the negative, I overdeveloped and exposed it also at filter 5, but there was some other magic done. I painted the negative to get rid of the table because she had a table over here and I didn't know just how to mask it or whatever, so I simply painted with red gouache on the negative. With this print, I started the whole double exposure journey. It was my very, very first one. I did it first very small and then kind of blew it up. And I knew that those two negatives would go together. So I did not overexpose, overdevelop or anything like this because I knew they would not overlap. The trick here was to create this horizon line. Whenever I tried this blending thing, it just created a gray, ugly cloud. So I created a fake horizon I think here the horizon is maybe slightly higher. By exposing the lower negative with a cardboard, not moving. And this is how I got the sharp line. And then when I exposed the clouds, which are not the clouds, it's a river at uh, long exposure, I was moving the cardboard like this, very softly blending in. And of course here we can see that it's uh, almost white, it's very light, but it looks natural because this is how we're used to seeing sunrises and sunsets. So all those little tricks, they kind of work. And if you want to learn anything else from my experiences, always use matte boards, which overlap a little bit with the print because I was um, not very experienced and uh, I didn't know that you could cut matte boards of your own size. And I bought the ready-made ones. so. It was really, really painful to super perfectly align all those double exposures. While I could have simply had a matte board which covers those edges and aligning perfectly is really difficult, very difficult. And it has nothing to do with your printing skills or anything. It just happens this like one millimeter off and throwing away a whole good print because of it is just simply not worth it. The double exposures I did for a group show this year are actually from a work project. I am documenting on black and white film what is probably the biggest construction site in Europe right now, the extension of land into the sea in the Principality of Monaco. 
I did a project about the reconstruction of Hotel de Paris and Place du Casino, also in Monaco, and a book got published this year actually. And if you would like to get one, I will leave the link below. It's all analog, 6x7, a work of two and a half years, and I guess a successful one because now I got upgraded to a bigger and much more challenging, honestly, construction site. Anyway, I wanted to do something non-straightforward and overlapped the construction site shots with flowers because buildings are also growing, flourishing and making everything around more beautiful. This is when I discovered Photoshop mockups. For this shot, I had to do the corner magic that I showed you before and some light burning on the flower at a high filter to make the shadows a bit deeper. Those two are a straightforward double exposure. See, not all prints need three hands and a tail. That one is my favorite and I reprinted it so many times. I wanted the flowers more pronounced on certain parts of the building. So I had to make a mask where is my mask? With a cut out exactly where I needed to burn, but then this line, those lines were too sharp, so I also had to soften them with my hands like this during burning. And importantly, if you're doing something like this, you have to glue a cardboard or another print on the back of the original mask because this paper is way too thin and light will go through and fog your entire image. Here is the other one. So, see, failed prints are sometimes useful. Some, someone told me that I should make... Um, um, oh, how are they called? Those books. Those things for books. All this photo montage is so much fun. Oh, and here on the wall, I have the easiest double exposure of all. Paper exposed to 180 degrees and exposed again. Et voila, surrealism. And since we're ending at surrealism, funny thing, I started filming without much passion for these shoes and electric tower print. My personal style of work is quite far from that. But as I was wrapping up and going home, it started heavily raining outside, so I couldn't leave the lab. I didn't feel like starting a new print, but I had a tray of exhausted developer and I vaguely remembered that it is good for solarization, which I tried several times before, failed every time, except once, but technically it wasn't even my success because this other guy who was in the same dark room was doing it and I was kind of helping him. Anyway, just to kill time, I tried it again and by nothing but a miraculous accident, it worked. So, of course, I needed to repeat the success on fiber-based paper and I got stuck in the darkroom for another six hours and I'm very happy to be sitting while recording this video today because I've been on my feet for so long in the past days, I can barely walk. And you know, it's not just those like three plus six, actually nine hours, oh, nine hours in the darkroom standing. It's also preparation, then cleaning while the prints are washing and also three and a half miles, six kilometers a day that my dog is demanding to walk. So I'm so done, but isn't it worth it? Like, wow, I actually now like this print. I guess the next logical step is to explore the surrealist special effects further and make a solarization tutorial, but maybe someone already did. I'm gonna Google that. And as for you guys, I hope this video gave you some new ideas about what could be done in the darkroom. Make sure to follow me on YouTube, Instagram and TikTok. And as usual, the written tutorial will be on my website, linabesanova.photography slash videos. See you in the next video. Bye.